Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Todd Keppel here with the Klamath County Museum. Uh, we've got quite a lineup of cars uh, here in Veterans Park. We've learned already that when I'm at one end of Veterans Park, people at the far end of the park, some of them had a little bit of trouble hearing us. So I'm going to park here in the middle uh, to get us started off, and uh, then we'll probably kind of spread out as we go from stop to stop. But we'll always tell you where we're going for our next stop. Um, also, I want to call your attention uh, on the handout. Uh, we've got a website that we set up for today's tour, and you can find that website at um, goclamath.com, just G-O-K-L-A-M-A-T-H, goclamath.com. So whether you're watching us on Facebook or uh, listening on the radio, you can go to that website. If you're driving, you know, don't go to the website, but if you've got a passenger, uh, you can maybe use a smartphone and go to the website. On that website, we've loaded up about eight pictures of various places along our tour today. And so uh, you can follow along with the pictures that way. We've also got a map on there so that if you get separated from the group for whatever reason or if you got to run to Burger King and get something to drink, you can rejoin the tour. You can even take the tour on your own later uh, by following uh, the map. Uh, let's see, a couple more announcements here. I've got a museum staffer, my colleague Kristen uh, Sonicson is in the car and she's got our um, museum cell phone and so she can receive text messages. If you're having any trouble picking up the signal or if you get lost or whatever, you can text, uh, text to Kristen and hopefully we can get you uh, straightened out. All right, we already had one set of dead batteries on our FM transmitter, but I think we're in good shape now. Um, all right, so before we uh, head out anywhere, we're just going to sit right here in the parking lot and talk for a little bit. Uh, if you have access to those photos on our website, then you can look at photo number one. And uh, on those photos on our website, here's an example of one. On these photos, on some of them, we put a red X to show where we're sitting, and so uh, the red X on our photo shows Veterans Park with Main Street kind of in the center of the photo and Klamath Avenue, and then off to the side there was the Ackley Brothers Mill, and that's really the first mill that we have to talk about. Uh, had another problem with our FM signal, so we think we got that going again. You can see the lineup of cars we've got here pretty well. Fills both end of the uh, Veterans Park. At any rate, uh, going back to our photo, you can see where the Ackley Mill was, uh, right down there on the corner where uh, the park road here, George Nurse Way, kind of turns into um, Klamath Avenue. Right on that curve is where the, the Ackley Mill was. It was really uh, the first mill, lumber mill in the downtown area. Uh, Modoc Lumber ended up taking over that mill, and uh, Ron, I think, was planning to talk a little bit more about that. He's really got most of the information on that. Uh, also, down here in this part of town, right about where the locomotive sits now is where uh, J. Fred Gaylor had his uh, door and sash mill. That was one of the early businesses that would take uh, raw lumber, uh, plane it, and then cut it into uh, like uh, door frames, window sashes, uh, that sort of thing. The first uh, really added value type of mill that I know of here in town. So mill number one, Hackley Brothers um, set up uh, around 19, I'm gonna say 19, uh, five or 10. Ron has that, we'll have to ask him about it. Um, operated for quite a few years and then eventually uh, that mill purchased by Modoc Lumber. Modoc Lumber operated uh, the mill for quite a while, but they eventually built a new mill, and we'll be showing you the spot uh, where they built their new mill. All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, take off towards our second stop. Our second stop is going to be over on uh, the Timber Mill uh, property, so we're just going to go down uh, Klamath Avenue here to Second Street and hang a right, and um, park in the timber mill uh, development area and I'll 
try to figure out a way that we can all get situated there and hopefully everybody can pick up our radio signal there. I'm going to turn the camera around here so people watching us on Facebook can uh, see. Uh, Ron, you're on camera here. So Lovely. Lovely. say hi to everybody. This is Ron Loveness who uh, spent most of his working life in the lumber business around here. Was it your dad and an uncle or somebody that had the mill down at Malin? Yes. Correct. There's one guy in the lineup here somewhere, Ron, that worked for Loveness and Modoc Lumber uh, back right. in the day. So no, nobody move. I'm just moving back towards the middle of the crowd to make sure my radio signal uh, reaches everybody. Am I getting a thumbs up from people hearing me? Yeah, okay, good. I think I'll pull in here. We've got enough of a lineup of cars here, Ron, that we're a little concerned that people at the back of the line won't be able to hear us. And it looks like we've still got people just now catching up with us. Ron, we were just talking about uh, the Ackley Mill. Um, do you have it in your notes there when they said, you said they started out as the Fitch Mill out in the country. It started out in 1894 in Hildebrand as a Fitch Mill, and it was the first mill in the county that had a permanent uh, setup for a boiler. It was the largest mill in Southern Oregon at the time, and it could cut uh, all between 20 and 30,000 board feet a day. But in uh, 18, see, in 1904, Mr. Fitch was uh, killed in a, in a log crushed him. So the Ackley brothers, uh, purchased the equipment and moved it to what was now at Veterans Park. And so it had become the longest operating machinery in the basin. It ran there until the mid-1960s when uh, uh, Bulldog Lumber later acquired it. And after it came to town here, they later on added a bandsaw, which increased the uh, capacity up to 50,000 board feet of uh, lumber a day. So it was a real high balling outfit for the day. So Modoc Lumber then operated it for some years, but then Modoc built a new mill down the lakeshore here, right? Correct, yes. First, uh, during the 1940s, uh, the Shaw family leased the Acme Mill and later on purchased it. And then in, in the mid-1960s, they built the new mill on uh, just to the right of us, which uh, in 1968 became Modoc Lumber on the site of what had been Originally, Big, Big Lakes Box, followed by Ellingson Lumber, and a short time owned by uh, Lauren Palmerton as El Dorado Lumber. And after uh, uh, Ellingson closed it, it burned, and then uh, the Shaw family bought the property in the, in the mid 1960s and uh, built a new modern mill that ran until the 90s. So, um Sitting here where we are now, if we were looking out to our right back in the day, we would have seen the Big Lakes Mill Correct. on the shore of the lake. Yes. Pretty much. And then all of this area in here was used for drawing lumber. Correct. Uh, at various times by both Big Lakes and uh, Modoc, right? Yes, uh, lumber and then, of course, log storage as well later on. And then Modoc had all kinds of different sheds. Uh, you know, uh, was there a planing mill? Oh, definitely. Uh, it started out, there was still remnants of the Ellingson Lumber Big Lakes box left uh, when Modoc took over the property and the Ellingson's lumber sheds, for example, the dry sheds were still used for lumber storage. And actually the uh, office we see on the left hand side was known as Modoc Lumber. The first portion of that was actually built by Lauren Palmerton when he had El Dorado Lumber. Those of us who are sitting here in our cars, we can uh, see that uh, building off there to the right. I think we better get moving and head on to uh, stop number three. Uh, for that stop, we're going to be going down here to South 6th Street and turning right. And then we're going to pull off on the uh, exit that goes to Spring Street. And we're going to go down Spring Street and have a look at uh, the Iwana Mill site. Ron, you might uh, take a minute to just kind of explain what a planing mill is. Uh, the, the planing mill is after you dry the lumber, it's actually to put a smoother surface on it and to make it a, uh, an even size or shape. You can even put on a, a pattern on it, such as in siding, things like that. So we're turning right on uh, South 6th Street 
Now, there's a look at, uh, that was an old auto, was that West One? Uh, yes. No, uh, Lakeside. Yeah. Lakeside Motors, wasn't it? That's what it was, I think, when I came here. And then just past Lakeside Motors on the right-hand side is a vacant lot now. There'll be a sign on it said Terra Mill Shores. That was an uh, auxiliary lumber drying yard for the Ackley Mill. And they would bring lumber down uh, Mammoth Avenue and Finn Fifth Street with lumber carriers and then hand pile the lumber there. Uh, the sun's probably shining right in the camera here, but looking to the right is this cold storage facility here. Uh, at the corner where are we get uh, Broad and South Six. That building there sits right where the old Great Northern uh, Passenger Depot was. Going by the nurseries at IFA here where they grow, uh, I guess, several million seedlings. Doug fir, Western Large, Ponderosa Pine. Looks like Doug fir right there. So those of you that are following along in cars, we'll see how we do here. I've been down here a couple times to kind of check this out. Uh, they've closed off their main entrance to the the property here at the old Iwana Mill site. Uh, you're going to see there's a big hole in the ground with a couple of crane, big old cranes sitting here. They're getting ready to build a new plant for intake of wastewater from the city of Klamath Falls. Uh, I have a lot of upgrades that are needed on our sewer plant here in town. and. So one key step is to build a new plant where all of the, the uh, material that we ship off from our kitchen sinks and toilet bowls and shower drains and everything, it all comes down here. So we've got a temporary entrance into the old mill site here, uh, kind of rough gravel. It might be a little dusty down here, but hopefully everybody will be able to navigate okay. So. Uh, They've got an operation down here, the city does, where they take old wood chips and mix them with sewage sludge and pile them up and, and uh, let it decompose and turn into compost. They had a little bit of excitement here this last week, Ron, I don't know if you saw that, where their pile caught on fire? Yes, I heard about that. Yeah, through spontaneous combustion. Uh, they think the guy, Ron, the operator that I talked to down here yesterday, said they think that rainstorm we had about a week ago might have put more water on the pile than they would like to have and so that uh, caused it to overheat actually it's kind of funny to think about water causing something to overheat but uh, that's the way it works it's a little like when you put up a stack of green hay and it's too wet it'll it'll uh, heat up and catch on fire so I'm just gonna invite everybody to follow along behind me as we approach the old burner here at Iwana uh, box factory lumber and box we're mainly here to to uh, look at this big burner right here. I think I saw that it's 85 feet uh, tall. And if you're able to look at those photos that we have on our website, that I uh, can't remember what number of photo it is. Uh, let me grab my pictures here. Yeah, this is a photo for Stop number three, there's Ron. Ron, uh, if you could tell us about this uh, this tower right here. Uh, this one is called a slab burner. You're kind of used to seeing what's called wigwam or teepee burners. This is a different design with a taller cone and to get a, a stronger draft out of it to burn even more material. And that thing burns so hot that it's actually lined with fire bricks in the bottom. And at one time they thought they would tear it down, but it was so sturdy, they thought they'd just leave it. But the problem they had then was, people started to go inside of it and remove the fire bricks from the bottom. So, in order to enter that, now it's been welded shut. Uh, interesting history about that, a guy named uh, Clyde Blowpipe Reese built that, the Reese Burner and Blowpipe Company. He came to Tama Falls in 1912, which is the year he wanted to start it, at a big government meeting. And uh, he came back and built that, that burner, the Reese burner. And you stop think about it, every little sawmill plant here, a molding plant, a planer mill had to have a blowpipe and, uh, and a waste disposal. And there's a real art to that, to make uh, material flow through the air, through a pipe, without plugging up. So 
So the Reese Blowpipe Company was one of the major fact one in the, uh, the Northwest. So we're standing right in the middle here of what would have been the Iwana Box Factory Lumber and Box uh, drawing yards. The lumber mill itself sat um, about where this big shed is right here. And uh, they would pull logs up out of the out of the lake. Let's see, I should turn around here. So where this big shed is next to the burner is about where the uh, the Iwana lumber mill stood. Both of them, one burned down, right? Yeah, actually, the Iwana box started as just a box factory, as did Big Lake's box, as did Klamath Lumber and Box. They were a box factory first, buying the lumber to the little mills in the area. Then later on, Big Lake's built a sawmill. Later on, Iwana built a sawmill. And later on, Bulldog Lumber built, uh, well, uh, Chelsea Box down here with we'll come to the next with a box factory to start with, and then uh, became a supplement mill by it. So it's kind of who was the chicken, who was the egg. And the, the very first box lumber was shipped out of Klamath Falls from the Ackley Mill, was put on a barge and taken down to uh, Addy, put on the train. Because California was desperate for box lumber after the San Francisco earthquake, and we were the closest uh, place to get it from outside the state. There was no railroad here yet from Ben, so we had a corner on the market, so to speak, for box lumber for quite a while. When we say boxes, and we might uh, take a minute to just explain oh, okay. what, what we mean by boxes. Everything, back in the day, came in a wooden box. And there's a few older people here can probably remember a lettuce crate. And it was a series of slats. There were like six on the top, six on the bottom, four on each side, nailed together with cleats, and then eventually nailed to an end piece. Well, there were a boxcar load of, of uh, lettuce crates that hold 15,000 empty crates knocked down. Each crate had over 30 pieces of wood in it. So we're talking about a half a million pieces of wood in every little every car load of box stuff that went out of here, such as for lettuce crates. And uh, apples had a different box. Oranges had their own crate. Uh, cantaloupe had a, a lug of its own. Cherries did not sh share the same lug as uh, apples and peaches, I don't know why, but everything came in boxes, wooden boxes at that time. And part of the reason too, remember back in the day, refrigeration was put ice in the front of the box cars. And you may talk about over here with a great big ice uh, icing facility for the railroad. And they would put in the ice in the front of the car and the draft as it traveled would melt the ice and create uh, coolness. Well then cardboard was invented, but guess what? Moisture and cardboard did not get along. So the wooden box prevailed until refrigeration was invented for the railroad cars. Well, we talk about the box factory too. That's why in the Klamath Falls the lumber industry didn't get hit as bad by the depression because about half of our lumber produced was for boxes, box ships. And that meant for agriculture, of course people still ate during the depression. And so a lot of people came to our town because there was some work available. But the real controversy at Iwana Box, and it had lots and lots of people, they would pay women less so the lady of the house would get a job and Pop couldn't find work. That upset quite a few people. Um, while we're traveling to the next stop, we're going to go back out, get on Spring Street, and uh, head east on South 6th. Right when we crossed the viaduct over here, going up on Spring Street, uh, excuse me, on South 6th Street, over the top of Spring Street, we're basically going to be passing right over the top of another mill that stood in the area in the early days. That was the Savage Brothers. And if you're looking at our photos online, I think that's uh, identified as stop number 3A. It's a nice picture of the Savage Brothers mill. Um, I don't know much about that mill, Ron. I don't know if you do, but they were just right on the side of the main line of Southern Pacific. Isn't that right? That, that's correct. And then, uh, actually, Big Lakes Box bought their planing mill facility. That was the beginning of Big Lakes Box. It was their first location. They I'll did see. not use the sawmill, just the box.
The aroma is not too bad here by the wastewater plant today. It was pretty rich yesterday. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, most of the of the uh, merciful logs. Let me repeat the question. Okay, the, the question was, are there still uh, logs in Lake Iwana? Because it was a log pond for up to seven sawmills at one time. Uh, a barge came through in the uh, in the 1960s and with divers and retrieved uh, anything that was large that uh, was merchantable. And as far as the uh, extent of the uh, sawdust and so forth, I, I don't know the status of it as of this point. I, I know when I was working at the Herald of News, uh, I had a couple of stories about how DEQ did have concerns. Oops, sorry about the seatbelt warning. DEQ had concerns about um, debris from logs in the lake. Of course, you know, DEQ has concerns about everything we do. But, sorry about the editorial comment. But, um, yeah, and so eventually I think it got to where DEQ was trying to force mills to stop storing their logs um, in the river. Columbia Plywood, I think they're still storing logs. I think some, yes. not, not nearly like they used to. Well, it, it so happened that about the time that the uh, log storage in water was the only way back in the old days you could actually handle logs and with manpower. Then modern machinery was developed and it became more efficient to actually handle them on land. So most mills voluntarily took them out of the water. Uh, the problem Columbia Plywood had, they don't have enough room on the land. Oh, they have but a very Bulldog small Lumber, Warehouser and all the others. They took their logs out of the water, as had, as says Thomas Lumber on Upper Mammoth Lake. It's cheaper now to handle with machines, and they have a bunch of men out there with rowboats, so to speak, or little little pond boats pushing around manually. I'm going to jump in here and just uh, remind everybody that as we're going up the uh, ramp to go over the viaduct, um, we're we're on the new viaduct. The original viaduct was to the left of us, or to the north of us here. It was actually right in line with the main right-of-way of 6th Street. When they built the new viaduct, it kind of curved around the old one. And uh, so as we travel on South 6th today, uh, we actually go right over the site of the Savage Brothers Mill and actually over probably a lot of the Big Lakes uh, buildings. <laughs> I don't know that the climate, the question was about tribal uh, resources and whether there is a tribal mill, and I don't think the Klamath tribes ever operated their own lumber mill. No, just way back in the 1800s, the uh, army, uh, part of the, of the uh, treaty was that they would provide a mill and a, and, a, and a sawyer for a period of time, which they did, and the little mill would move around the reservation wherever they needed the uh, some lumber. It started at, uh, at Fort Klamath. There was one set up at Yannix, and the, the mill would move around to wherever they, the need was. But of course, the reservation and, and its timber resources, that's a big topic there, and we won't wade into that uh, now. But a lot of the timber that was harvested on the reservation uh, almost certainly would have come to these mills that we're talking about today. Would uh, be fair to say, you think, Ron? Oh, yes, the majority of it. So uh, here at the head of the line, I'm just getting ready to turn right on Washburn Way. Boy, this intersection has changed a lot since uh, you were a kid knocking around here. Ron. Oh, it was 60. It was too lame, huh? I was a little kid. Actually, it's changed quite a bit since I came here in 1990. But you know, we just passed a bunch of lumber yards without saying anything about that. Well, those are retail lumber yards, and there was some remanufacturing. Uh, window door makers and things like that. It's all pretty small in this in this area. Now one of the lumber yard buildings is still standing there. Yeah, the former Copeland lumber yard, yes, it's now the head starter, whatever it is. Uh, yeah, so Copeland and uh, I think Home Lumber was one of the yeah, yes. outfits and McCollum. And Klamath Valley Lumber was there all along South 6th Street. McCollum, they had a mill out at uh, Topsy on the Green Springs Highway, which I guess we now call Highway 66, but they also had a retail yard uh, here in town. Yeah, 
and McCullum leased a mill on Upper Klamath Lake, and then he owned the sawmill in, in Milan, that's where my my family purchased that in 1946. Oh, really? When they came to Oregon. So we're uh, we've turned right on Washburn Way, and we're going to go down here to Crosby, and then. So this is probably our most awkward stop on the tour, and maybe it isn't a very good stop, but I just uh, thought it was worth mentioning that uh, Reach, Reach Inc., which is actually going to be viewed for your, through your rear view mirror if you're headed down south on Maywood Drive. Reach Inc. is in the old Maywood plant. Uh, this road here, the street is named Maywood for the original plant that built here in uh, 1976. Company out of Texas, Amarillo, Texas, uh, located up here and, and built this plant. And in 1976 they made doors and they peeled logs to make veneer. And it was one of the kind of plants that Klamath Falls really liked to see come in here because um, you know a sawmill could saw lumber and then those boards could be resawn into thin little boards that were called shook, shook material, for making uh, the, the crates that Ron was talking about for shipping fruit and produce. But when the box industry collapsed with the development of corrugated cardboard especially, then, um, then we needed something else to make with our lumber. And of course, Modoc lumber, I, I don't know if I want to get Ron started on this, but they would make uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, they made the alphabet blocks and uh, yes, uh, Boy Scout uh, Pinewood, Pinewood Derby, Derby car yeah, blocks, yeah. mouse mouse trap mouse banks. traps, yeah, uh, stool seats for schools, stool seats, yep, round seats for stools, huh. stools for schools. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so one company in Texas bought sixty thousand stool seats from us every year, but that was the goal then was was secondary manufacturing, and we had several in, over the past. The Mettler Brothers were were a big one, and one that's still left now in the area is down at Doris, Doris Lumber and Molding. They've been very long, long operating and successful. But windows and doors are, are a big a big factor. We mentioned earlier that a good half of the lumber, the low grade, would go for box shook. The upper grades then were used for windows and doors and moldings. Of course, so, Geld Wynn. And, 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 and Geld Wynn got is in that now, yes. So at some point, um, um, Maywood closed, I think that was around 1992, I know they were downsizing by that time, so they didn't last all that long here. Uh, by 1995, Reach had moved into that building up there. Uh, they do um, some wood products, they, they do some sawing in there, they make pallets, I think, and uh, maybe some other stuff. The nice thing about Reach is that they... Um, uh, provide employment for folks who have disabilities. I'm going to take just a quick drive towards the back of the uh, line here and I'm going to do a sound check. Oh, there's Bill Johnson. Bill, have you been picking us up okay back here? I'm just going to drive up here and ask him how. Oh, he's giving me the thumbs down. Well, Ron, we got a pretty fantastic turnout. I'll say. For this tour today. Um, we kind of wondered how this would work from a number of standpoints. Uh, we got the idea from churches. There's a bunch of churches around the area that are conducting their church services over FM radio. And uh, what they do is they have people just gather up in the parking lot of the church. And then the worship team and the preacher and whatnot, they are just there in the, in the parking lot of the church. And they do their service that way. And I thought, well, that, that might be a good way for us to do tours. Uh, so we probably have a few too many cars today for it to really work uh, well. So appreciate everybody's patience uh, with the way this is going today. Another outfit that's still in town here, Ron, is uh, the Fremont Millwork. Yes. And they've been here a long time. Do you know much about their operation? I do not. They mainly, as I understand it, it's they make uh, uh, cabinets uh, for commercial as well as uh, for home. Yeah, if you go online to Fremont Millwork, I was looking at it this morning, they make a lot of cool stuff, uh, special kind of like custom type work, I think. Yes. It's, they've been in business a long time here in town. They were started in, uh, I think, 1956 or so, and uh, and still in business today over here on Onyx Avenue. We won't go by there today. 
All right, we're gonna head on to our next stop. Uh, we got quite a bit of driving to do here now. So I hope everybody can uh, hear me. A reminder that a map for this tour is available on our website. If you go to goclamath.com, there's a link there to a Google map and uh, you can follow that map either today or like I say, you could follow it uh, later on on your own. We're gonna be headed back out on Washburn Way south all the way to the Southside Bypass and then we're gonna turn right and head west on the south side, I guess it's supposed to be the south side expressway now. I don't really think it's an expressway. It's like half of it's an expressway yeah. and half of it's just a regular highway, which makes it dangerous in my opinion, but uh, I'm sorry about the editorializing. Um, anyway, uh, then we're going to turn right on Tingley and go back in to where the uh, livestock auction is. Um, and, and we're going to go quite a ways back in there on some windy roads. So we'll take it nice and slow and hopefully keep our caravan uh, together. And we're going to end up um, by the water tower uh, where the old mill was. Yeah, sorry, fellow. We're going to end up where the old mill was uh, on the south end of Lake Iwana. You can actually see that water tower uh, to the right uh, over the top of the brush there. That's where we're going to end up. We're going to be going over a little bit of gravel uh, out here, but it's all pretty smooth road. Klamath Livestock's been in operation here a long time. Uh, sometime I'd like to research that, but they've been, uh, they're still having sales out here, I, I think every Tuesday. Which side of tracks was the fairgrounds on, do you know? Uh, they were, the fairgrounds were right where we're going. Yeah. Loveness is a local treasure. Local? A local yokel. No, a, a local treasure. Ron, um, when you and Krista and I came out here a couple of weeks ago to scout this tour out, I was asking you what this building here was. Yes. Uh, so I found on one of the old maps that KLAD was headquartered here. Yeah, I knew that. For a time. But what was it before that? What was it before that? Yeah. In the 1920s, uh, 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 Setzer Brothers built Chelsea Box out here, and you wonder why in the world you're out here. Well, Still says live this is where the uh, railroad was. Oh, back, back. So they wanted to be on the rail. And they, they strictly bought lumber from other mills and made it into to box, to box ship. And then later on it was sold to another outfit, and uh, then it burned. You can jump on it. Shortly after that, uh, Shaw Bertram built a sawmill on this site. And you see the, uh, the water tower that's here. That was came from uh, Shaw Bertram originally. And uh, Shaw Bertram ran the mill for a few years and then they uh, sold it to the Southern Pacific Railroad in order for them, the Shaw family, to go down and build a new mill in TNS in Modoc County, California. And then the Southern Pacific leased this mill to Longbell. And you'll notice Longbell is a name on the water tower. They were the last people that operated this. And then in the 1940s, a warehouser bought the plant. And the main reason they bought it was to get the Longbell tract of timber up in northern Klamath County. And then the warehouser dismantled, dismantled the mill. It's, this was so remote back in the day that, that Chelsea Box and then later on uh, the Shaw Bertram Lumber Company had to bring their crew out here by boat because the roads were so horrible. Wintertime, any kind of bad weather, it was impassable. And of course, everything else, the wood and so forth came in by rail and left by rail. But the roads out here all but did not exist. Ron, I'm gonna jump out just for a minute and kinda of show people on, on Facebook what the lay of the land looks like. Um, and one piece of history that uh, Ron wasn't able to cover is that before Chelsea built their box factory out here. Uh, there, there's another important uh, piece of history that happened out here and that's the uh, county fairgrounds. We're located 
right in here somewhere, um, 1911, thereabouts. Uh, the first county fairgrounds were uh, back in town, about where the Southern Pacific Switchyard is now. There's a fairgrounds there for a couple of years, and then in um, about 1911 is when, uh, well, I suppose when the railroad came through in 1909, maybe, is when they pushed the fairgrounds out. So the county had a fairgrounds out here. There's a big old grandstands out here, and they had some great rodeos uh, for a few years out here. And then uh, in 19, about 1922 or so, uh, the county acquired the Ace of Fordyce Dairy property on South 6th Street and moved the fairgrounds back into town. So here's the site of uh, Chelsea Lumber and Box and the later Shaw Bertram. And there's the water tower. Uh, that Ron was talking about. Still in use, uh, Ron says. I think I read where uh, this water tower holds about 75,000 gallons of water. We're going to look at another water tower um, over at the at the uh, Kesterson Mill. One of the water towers holds 75,000 gallons and the other 100,000 gallons. I forget which is which now. This factory here, by the way, sits where the old tallow plant was, the old rendering company. And uh, now it's uh, industrial oils. It's an oil, a used oil re-refining plant. So all your oil change places around town, uh, anybody that has you know volumes of oil, uh, it gets uh, brought out here, and they re-refine the oil so that it can be used uh, again for other purposes. And that's about as much as I know about oil re-refining. Oh, here's a good look at uh, our car, car caravan all gathered up. So what a great turnout today and uh, so far I feel like we're doing okay. Um, our little power supply that's plugged into the car hasn't overheated or anything yet and uh, we haven't had too many dead batteries so far so you know, we're doing okay. Um, here's Charlie and Nancy Thompson. Charlie's the chairman of our uh, museum foundation board. So Charlie, it's good to see you showing up for a museum event <laughs> here. Tour. And Great Nancy tour. often helps with the uh, museum stuff <laughs> from time to time. So are we ready to head on to Kesterson? All right, we'll move out. We're gonna head right back out the same road we came in and go back out to the uh, Southside Bypass. Southside Expressway, sorry. So a comment has come back to us uh, that somebody had a, a relative who had an, uh, was a um, victim of an industrial accident in the mill here and lost a leg. A lot of stories like that, huh, Ron? Too many. Over the years, uh, lives lost, uh, men crushed in, under machinery, limbs, fingers lost. Dangerous, dangerous business. It was a real miracle back in the day if you spent much time or a short career in a box factory if you retired with all your fingers, it was the exception rather than the rule. If you're within range also, we wanted to give you a tip that there's a kind of an interesting site coming up. Uh, there's no way we could do a, a stop here, although we <laughs> are stopped anyway. But um, on the west bank of the river, uh, to the north of the bridge, about where those uh, center beam lumber, empty lumber cars are, are over there, there's what we call a, a log slide, or sometimes we call it a beaver slide. It's where logs were dumped off, off of rail cars and dumped into the, uh, into the river. Well, there's my first honk of the day. All right, I'm going to try to ease back out into traffic here. All right, let's go for it, people. Uh, to the right, you'll be able to see a concrete structure with some metal strips on it. Uh, looks like it's, what, about 150 yards north of the bridge, yes. right on the edge of the river, right there. And uh, that's where logs were dumped off rail cars and went splashing down into the river. And you can see the piling out in the river here where they um, contained the logs that were floating on the lake. So back in the day, this whole river here, would have been, at times, practically covered with, with logs and storage. This is the uh, site of the Kesherson Mill. 
built here in the 1930s. The Ketchersons came up from Butte Valley. Uh, they had been operating in Northern California until Great Northern put this railroad in to the uh, warehouse plant. So they built a new mill here. And I understand that the Great Northern had a hand in encouraging them to be here because they railed a lot of logs in from Northern California on the Great Northern Railroad. So that was a, an incentive for them to do that. Catrice operated the plant through World War II and then later on in the 50s. And then when they closed it, the De Georgia Corporation bought it and they relocated from their facilities on the Upper Klamath Lake. There's a lot more room to expand down here in a much more modern mill. Um, actually, the mill they were using up there, the old Klamath Lumber Box, was the remnants of one of the Moore, Moore Brothers mills on, on Lake Iwana, so it was really antiquated machinery. But this was a full operation here with uh, a box factory, a mill, a uh, vault of dry kills. It was a good operation. Um, did you talk about DG Shelter? I did. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry I wasn't listening to you. All right, <laughs> I'm gonna grab the mic back from here. Sorry about our sound problems. It looks like one of our transmitters got off on its uh, frequency. Um, Kristen, if you want to just turn around and show people the uh, machine shop there. I always called it a machine shed, but I think that's a farm term. Uh, in the lumber mill business, I would have been the machine shop. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that building on the left, that and a little more to the left there, Kristen. Yeah, right in the dead center there. Now, is uh, that was the machine shop for Kesterson Lumber, and then later, uh, DG Shelter. I just learned yesterday from Dave Doveri, uh, he said that uh, that shop had a line shaft in it. And I said, well, you're going to have to tell me what a line shaft is. And he said that they had one motor that powered the entire shop with a shaft that ran the length of the shop. And if they needed to run a piece of equipment, they would hook a leather belt up to that shaft and they could run multiple pieces of equipment off of the one shaft uh, that operated there. So, uh, did we get a good look at the water tower? You might just pan oh, around there. I thought it would move slower. And, uh, here's the original water tower. The wigwam burner was just to the left of the water tower. And then the mill, of course, just to the right of the water tower. Uh, water towers, you saw one in just about every modern mill, right? Because the, the main reason was you needed a water tower that would provide water without power because the mills would often catch on fire. This is the your pump. So you always had gravity fed water. Good plan. Uh, that was the end of a lot of lumber mills around here. Is they operated until they burned down. And then, uh, a lot of them rebuilt, but I'd say maybe most of them didn't. It depends on whether or not they had a source of uh, timber that they would rebuild. Oh, and insurance. Uh, back in the day, we were, it was called a mutual insurance. The fire was so bad that you were actually assessed a member of the mutual association. If you had a bad year, you had to pay more. And if you were really bad, they wouldn't let you in the association. Well, that's the way insurance companies that's work. That's if, right. if you don't really need it, then uh, you right. can get the cover. All right, we've had a special invitation here, which is pretty neat today. The operator of J and P, uh, James C, J &P, it's J and P Trust and something is the name of the company that operates out here. Yeah, while we're here, we'll talk about the other two major plants. Uh, I got uh, it. Two miles was Warehouser. It came in uh, 1929, and that's what really made Klamath Falls take off. If you look at uh, go through downtown the touring, so many of the major buildings were built in the late 1920s because Warehouser was coming to town. And then after Warehouser, and, and well, when Warehouser built, it was the largest pine sawmill in the world. It had four head rigs. It replaced the previously largest sawmill pine mill was the uh, Red River Lumber Company in, uh, in Westwood, California, in Lassen County. And they operated to, uh, and expanded later on with uh, plywood, particle board, and hardboard, and ran up until the 90s. And then they closed the uh, log processing facilities and sold the uh, hardboard plant to Collins Products, which still operates it. And just north of the bridge, Klamath River Bridge here, was originally called Calpine, Calpine Plywood. So it was the first plywood company in the area. It later became uh, Klamath Plywood, and now it's Columbia Forest Park. You want to look? I can't see. Major uh, plywood uh, manufacturer. 
no, it's uh, still operating, thank you. Okay, we're gonna turn around and head inside that building right there. When we're driving through this shed, it had a, a huge overhead crane back in the day. They could move lumber around. And it was really fascinating to watch them because the man had to climb up a big ladder and the crane moved back and forth near the ceiling. And that's where he spent the day, driving that crane back and forth. So J&P uh, takes lumber and they make trusses out of it for building construction. There's a stack of trusses that are stacked over here, lying down on the ground. Uh, that's an order that apparently never got picked up. And then uh, to the right here, you can see another order that they processed. They're not working today because of the train traffic. They were expecting a train in here, which we just saw. And so I guess because of that train traffic, they were not able to operate today. Ron, there were at one time two of these big sheds out here. Yes. Right? yes. What happened to the other one? There was a, the other big shed was used, to being rented out for storage after the DeGiorgio uh, closed. And uh, Leonard Putnam had purchased these and it was called, uh, this was known as the pig farm for some reason. I think there was a pig farm out here next to Reams Golf Course back in the day. Anyway, it was full of boats and motorhomes and so forth and uh, it caught fire and everything was lost in it. It uh, was really a hot, hot fire. And actually that was the building that had the overhead crane in it, it wasn't this one. So a lot of material stored I had. This looks like on this side, uh, this must be material that's stored for um, sturdy craft or whatever the panel product. It could be. It looks like part of the board to me. You're going to tell me if I'm about to run into something, right? You'll feel it. <laughs> if I hear glass breaking, I'll know it should back up. This is another tree. Take a tour of the building here. Imagine all the labor that took place in this building over the decades. When we pull out of the building here, we're going to see uh, logs that are decked on um, Columbia plywood. And we also notice there's this tank farm out here. I don't know what that's about. I don't know who's behind me. Uh, looks like a white Chevy. Um, we're going to... Okay, we're going to circle around to the right here. I'm going to pull up and find out who this owner is here again. Hang a right right there and it'll take you right back. Don't go up over that, but that'll take you right back out of... Great. Would you tell us again who you are? Denny Baronbaum with J&P Wholesale. Well, Denny, thanks a lot. Oh, great. Okay. Say it again. Pat Jewel, Denny Baronbaum with J&P Wholesale. Pat Jewel's the owner. Oh, okay. Well, uh, thank you for letting us come through today. And what a treat to get to drive through the old building there. Yeah, Enjoy. that's super. All right, thanks a lot. Yeah, I don't know if I did an adequate job of explaining where we're headed next. So we're going to go back out on um, Southside Bypass. We're going to turn right on Green Springs and uh, head back down to Riverside Drive. I'm going to tell Pipe people about that marker too. Uh oh. There's the old historic marker for the town of Merganser. How could we have forgotten to talk about that? We didn't, I, I remember. here before Linkville was here. Mm -hmm. Lakeport and Merganser, yes. 
Uh, so we're looking at those blue buildings that are on your right there. Um, this operation began, I think, over on Homedale Road, isn't yeah, that where correct. they started out? And uh, and it was started by Le Leonard, right? No. no. Who was it? The other one. Tom? No, no uh, Tom's father. Um, Mr. Putnam. And his son Tom. And his son Tom started a business called Sturdy Craft, and they were over on uh, Homedale Road. And uh, let's see if I can get this right or if you have to correct me, Ron, but they would take particle board, mainly from uh, the Weyerhaeuser plant and then later Collins products, and they would make it into uh, like shelves and cabinets, the kind of stuff you'd buy at, at uh, you know, your home supply store. Um, started in 1970 over there on Homedale. And then, uh, was it in the 90s? They started moving out here and they built a great big building out here. In the 80s. 80s. And then they built a second building out here. And then eventually it changed hands and it became uh, thermopressed laminates. And then about six years ago, it got bought out, bought out again by an outfit in Alpena, Michigan called Panel Processing. And this operation here they call Panel Processing of Oregon. So inside these huge buildings, they have operations where they are doing the same thing. They're taking uh, particle board and uh, cutting it. I think they line it with some kind of uh, covering. That's all they're doing, lining it. They're not cutting anything anymore. Oh, they just line it with some kind of covering yes. and and then ship it on yeah. yes. somewhere else. It can be wood grain or solid color uh, surfacing on on either, a, either particle board or plywood or hardwood. All right, so in case you didn't hear my announcement before, if you're gonna stick with us, uh, we're gonna skip the stop where we look at the uh, Great Northern Roundhouse. If you're really into railroad history, I'll be happy to take you there again uh, today if you want to. Uh, but our last stop and now is gonna be down on Riverside Drive. So we're gonna go out here to uh, Southside Expressway. We're gonna turn right on. Turn left on um, Southside Expressway, and then we're going to turn right on Green Springs and uh, take the old highway into town. So here we go. We're talking about the Dog Pound building here on the right. Um, yeah, it was more of an operation. That maybe is like more of just the office. That went down. And uh, they actually had a pet cemetery out here at one time. And an incinerator. Oh, we don't want to talk about that. That's, that's my main purpose. <laughs> <laughs> it was the last stop. Yeah. Well, we all have to face that. We've got a few details to add about the injury that occurred back at uh, the Shaw Bertram location. We talked about how somebody suffered an industrial accident, lost a limb. It was Neil Leberlein's, what did you say? Grandfather. Uh, lost a limb there. This uh, view that we're about to get here is one of the prettiest views in the basin. So Great Northern still brings gas into the tank farm here, yeah. occasionally. Okay, this one and, and the other one out there, which I, I gather is stopped, maybe. All right, I think we got everybody here now. So uh, the reason we've stopped here, this may not look like all that obvious of a mill site, but it uh, really is. Where we are parked here is very close to where uh, the Moore brothers had their mill um, in the early 1900s. Do you want to recount the, the Moore story there? Oh, you need the speaker, huh? There you go. The microphone. Yeah, actually, the second mill on Lake Ilana Sorry, was folks. the Moore Brothers. His, the Moore Brothers had their first mill up on the river, starting in 1877, uh, near what now Klamath kind of Falls. A small water-powered water mill. Had a crew of 10 to 12 people. They would saw between 10 and 12,000 board feet of lumber a day, like, you know, three or four wagon loads. Then in 1907, after 30 years up on the river, they moved down to here. 
and build a steam mill, much faster with uh, four times the production. It didn't run very long. Uh, in 1910, they sold it to the Anderson Clark. They ran it a couple years and then sold it to Big Basin. The Big Basin had it for about two years, and they closed it. And that machinery was moved up to become Klamath Lumber and Box at Shippington built next to the uh, Earl Fruit Company's uh, box factory. The old, old machine. And this site was prepared by the Adams Dredge. This was swamp prior to that. So this was not accessible until the Adams Dredge came up here. There, the... There's a little piece of the dredge work that I think um, Ron is still visible. Just to the south of the Eagle Perch, there's a cut that comes in off the lake. And that cut came under the I mean, the highway wasn't here at the time, but uh, it came under the highway and it kind of curved around. And this might actually be a remnant of that cut, that little uh, trough right there where the cattails are. So if you look at this site from uh, like Google Maps or Google Earth, uh, you can still see that the remnant of that cut over there. So right in here is where that mill was. Why don't you grab your uh, picture there? Uh, Ron uh, has a panoramic photo here. Um, did, uh, what's her name give that to you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Bill and Don Mesner. It's a um, compilation of pictures that were, that were at Big Lake's uh, box office. If you put it together, the composite shows uh, several of the lakes on, on Lake, uh, mills on Lake Iwan in 1925. So uh, we're going to uh, end our tour at this spot here, and we'll end it in just a minute or so. If you'd care to, you can come out. Uh, get out of your car if you feel safe doing that and come on up and have a close look at this picture. You can see the slab burner at Iwana Box and there's the Iwana Box Mill. Beautiful and there's big lakes and over here is, uh, uh, well, there's all kinds of stuff in here. Oh, and here's Ackley and you can see the remnants of where the Moore Mill had been. There's Riverside School up on the hill. So let's see, I guess I'm ready to wind up by saying thank you for your patience uh, with us today. If you're watching on Facebook or driving along in your cars, it's been such a great uh, crowd and everybody's been uh, patient and we appreciate the applause we're getting here uh, from cars. Very different uh, kind of a tour that we've had here today, but uh, we'll try to get more organized and offer some more of these and hopefully they'll run smoother than this one has. Ron, thank you very much. Do you handshakes? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Appreciate it. Ron. Ron does a lot of tours, by the way, um, during, well, used to, uh, during the year. I don't know if you're still doing them. Uh, yep. Some. Yeah, the geezer tours, as he refers to them as. So, uh, anyway, thanks again, Ron, Kristen. Thank you for uh, helping out. So long, everybody.